that is where the list comes from, is the database. So if you've got something going on, put it in the database, it also goes here. It also is utilized by travel writers. When they're going to write a story about a certain area of the state, they go to that database and they pull that up to find out information they can include in their article. So at no cost to you, you can have that kind of exposure. The other thing is, you, in this same publication, there's always editorial and photos. That also is something that's available to you. You don't have to write it, but if you have something, they're always, the ed editor is always looking for something new and unique that's happening in the state, like maybe a haunted hotel. And if you submit the idea to them, they'll write the article. They'll send a photographer out to take photos and everything. And you get all that kind of exposure at no cost to yourself for just merely submitting the idea of, hey, this, we think this is something unique. Okay. Infrastructure. Okay, and infrastructure, I think most people know when you're talking about roads and airports and trains and buses and water and power and all those kind of things. Especially critical for tourism is parking and signage. Signage is a big one because if you invite people to come into your community or your area and they want to see a certain attraction, whatever, whether it's a state park or the Iowa, Upper Iowa River or the Haunted Hotel, whatever it is, uh, you need to make sure that they're able to find that. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that really is difficult because MnDOT does have some rules and regulations that kind of go contrary to what we're trying to do. We'd like to have all kinds of signs directing people, but their rules and regulations keep it at a minimum so that they don't have too many signs out there. So but that is something that's critical. You need to make sure that people can find what it is you're advertising when they come. Services. And there we're talking about lodging, restaurants, retail businesses, those kind of things that, you know, that they need to take care of the wants and needs of that tourist. Okay? You need one of the things that I run into a number of times in communities um, is that they go through the process of making this plan and they're going to market to the, to the tourists. They're going to get them to come to their community and then their retail businesses close on Saturday and Sunday when the tourists are going to be there. There's no retail for them to spend their money. You know? So that's something that needs to be worked out locally that, hey, if we're going to work together, we're going to benefit you but you got to be open. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't be closed when they're here. They're not going to buy anything. And I always kind of, not kidding, but not kidding, say, you know, when we're promoting tourism, our main objective is to get that customer or that traveler to stay in our area as long as possible and spend as much of their money as they can here. We want to give them as many opportunities to spend their money as we can. Because <laughs> if they don't spend it here, they'll go down the road and they'll spend it at the next town yeah. or the next one. So, uh, again, it's kind of kidding, but yet it isn't. The other thing is, so many people will try to sell people what they want to sell. You know, rather than looking at it, what does the customer want to buy? And, you know, that's, that's a, a, a crucial difference. You might say, well, what's the difference between the two? There's a big difference, you know, what you have are trying to sell or what they really want. So that takes a little bit of, of uh, research, uh, simple research, and just asking. You know, if you get people in, say, what, do you, what is it that you're looking for? And then try to match those things together with the retail outlets. Hospitality is the final ingredient. And basically what, that, what we're talking about there is that how the tourists are treated by the community residents and employees in the tourism businesses and at the attractions. Another true story, the, uh, how many of you ever heard of the Minnesota design team? Yeah. Okay. I just wrote about it. Okay. Well, for the rest of you, it's a group of, uh, oh, like landscape architects, designers, planners, etc., that will come out into a community 
and they'll spend several days interviewing local people and looking at downtowns and whatever, and then they'll draw up diagrams and plans of what you could do. You know, if you want to do what you could do to make it really look really looks like something. Well, I did. I, I was involved with one of those in a small town in southeastern Minnesota. I don't name who it was. <laughs> okay, it was Preston. You twisted my arm. <laughs> and this has been quite a few years ago. And my portion of it was obviously to talk about tourism with the locals and see, you know, come up with a plan of what they could do. Well, in the interview process, what they do is they have local residents come sit down with you and you ask questions and, you know, they ask questions and you just kind of get a handle on what what it is they're interested in. Well... In the, the interviewing process, I kept hearing the local residents talk about the outsiders. When they come in, the outsiders do this and the outsiders do that. You know, and I thought, there's one thing they can change. Uh, and the other comment I kept hearing is, well, we don't want to be like Lanesboro. And I'm thinking in my mind, well, Lanesboro has been very, very successful. What's wrong with being like Lanesboro? But anyhow, so we you know, got into a little more depth with that. And one of the recommendations I had was you treat those visitors when they come in as guests, not outsiders. Just change that word. These are my guests into my community. And it makes a world of difference to how the local residents perceive those people instead of being outsiders, they're guests. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the reason they didn't want to be like Lanesboro, I'll come to find out, was because the residents around the Lanesboro area were used to, prior to the bike trail and everything, to be able to go into downtown on Saturday and Sunday and park right in front of the store they wanted to visit. And, you know, well, when all the tourists started coming, they couldn't do that anymore. And that's why they didn't want to be like Lanesboro. But it was not a, something I, I think they needed to really look at. It might be good to be somewhat like Lanesboro. <laughs> okay, now... Let's look at the yellow sheet. We're getting that in April. Oh, we are. Minnesota Design Tool. Okay, great, great. And that's uh, all. They do a heck of a job, yeah. and it's. I'm anxious now. You know, the, the thing, you know, it, just like any project, no matter what you're talking about, whether it's tourism development, or if it's the design team saying what you could do with the, the buildings and the parks and the whatever in your community. Probably the biggest hurdle for any of that is the funding, to come up with the funding to be able to do it. And, you know, unfortunately, that's just, that's life. Did, the, <laughs> I mean, did Preston do anything with what you did, some, did with it? Some, some, yeah, they did do some. It, uh, you know, they didn't do everything, but nobody ever does. Because, oh, I, I mean, these these people just go all out. I mean, they make it like a, a home and garden Community, if you know, if you had the money, you could really make it look sharp. But most most communities can't, mm -hmm. you know, to that extent. So, mm -hmm. okay, now we're going to talk about the ten factors or conditions the most important for successful tourism development in rural areas. First, first thing listed is a complete tourism package. Now, that includes like lodging, restaurants, shopping, golf, museums. Etc. 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 Now, most small communities don't necessarily have all of that, and that's one of the things that we do is encourage them and you to work with your neighbors. You know, work, try to work together with some of the other communities in your in your vicinity, and maybe they can. If you don't have room for them to stay overnight in the haunted hotel. They can. I shouldn't say that. I keep saying, bringing that back up. Uh, maybe they'll have to. Maybe they'll stay in Austin, and then they'll come down the highway to visit and do different things. You know, from here all the way down to the Iowa border. You know, it's just working together. You can give that potential tourist a lot more to do or have available to do than by each individual small community by itself. Because it is limited. I mean, it's just the nature of it. You do have a lot of things that you can utilize. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But just some things that um, in driving down today I've noticed or from being in the area quite a bit uh, that I ha you know, have come to realize that you have some, 
some really good potential for development. Second thing is good community leadership. And again, that goes back to the educating local residents and elected officials about the importance of tourism and what is you know what does it do for our area you know what could it do number three is support the support and participation of local government and again that's part of the education process but you get involved with that with zoning permits for different things all you know, all those governmental things that you if you're going to develop festivals and events and tourism attractions you need to have them on your side too you know, you don't want the county commissioners or the city council or whoever say, "Ah, we don't want we don't want that." You want to educate them of why it's important that we should have it. 